Welcome back to the Revolution in Ideology series on the Mau Mau Rebellion in Kenya. Today we are picking up with life, quote unquote, behind the wire. I can't take credit for that quote. Again, that quote comes to us from our main inspirational source for this series, uh, Britain's Gulag by Carolyn Elkins. Uh, essentially, though, what we want to talk about today is how the Mau Mau resistance fighters, even after being captured and put into the uh, disgusting concentration camps that the British has set up throughout the Kenyan countryside remained uh, resolute and continued their resistance in the concentration camps. Um, Mau Mau communal values in these camps grew over time. There was safety in numbers and being in the camps created more and more solidarity. Small organizations within the camps began to form with their own social structures and ways to survive, again, concentration, uh, for lack of a better term. Even new leaders began to rise to prominence within the camps, like Josiah Kariuki. Uh, we get his account in what was called Mau Mau Detainee. And these leaders were often selected uh, somewhat democratically uh, or through consensus by, their, of course, their peers, by how well they were able to help their fellow prisoners essentially cope with the horrors of disease and torture um, and, and essentially uh, over, being overworked. Some of the examples of the ways that these individuals would be able to uh, basically cope would be written down and codified into uh, uh, basically publications. And I, I use the word publications super loosely as these publications would not be like formally published. They would, of course, uh, be taken through um, uh, what is called the Manyani Times, but I'll get to that in just a second. But some of these rules for basically surviving the camps were called the 12 Laws of Laudwar, uh, the Magetta Manifesto. These are just a few examples. In fact, let's discuss that now. The Manyani Times was essentially like this, this, uh, this collection of works that were usually smuggled both within and between different camps in a whole bunch of very creative ways. In other words, uh, uh, it was not like a formal newspaper or anything along those lines. It was anything but. Books, of course, would be written in. Books that already existed as some of the camps had libraries. Uh, of course, uh, messages would be hidden in these books, and these books would then be distributed throughout camps or between different camps. Messages would be written into uh, actual cigarette butts, and those cigarette butts would be, of course, flicked outside of the camp and then picked up by children and then distributed to other camps. Um, in fact, even uh, essentially uh, uh, non-written communication would be part of what was colloquially called the Manyani Times. Uh, individuals would pretend to go into seizures and their bodily movements would actually be communicating um, um, certain sort of messages that could be spread throughout camps. Uh, there would also be unfamiliar slang used, uh, certain Kikuyu slang um, that conveyed uh, clandestine messages that were meant to be spread. Anyway, all of this put together became, again, what's called the Manyani Times. And this is where we get things like the 12 Laws of Laud War. Regardless, it's important to note that all of this reveals the remaining agency of not just the Mau Mau rebels that were caught, but other Kikuyu. Whether or not those Kikuyu were fully sympathetic to the Mau Mau is, is irrelevant here. This sort of agency reveals how far people were willing to go to ensure not just their survival in the camps, but maintain the trajectory of an independence-minded ethos in Kenya. There was also an impromptu schooling that took place in these camps. Essentially, the schools would crop up on the camps, not created by the British colonial uh, uh, leaders, not created by the Kenyan loyalists, but by the detainees themselves. And they would be schooled on a whole host of subjects, but of course, most importantly... Kikuyu history, and they would reassert their spiritual beliefs, they would create solidarity, and importantly teach the wild hypocrisy of European Christianity, uh, which is important to note because as we've discussed in prior videos, one of the things that the British sought to do in many of their colonial processes was impart their ideologies on the colonial subjects. Of course, we know Christianity being one of them and discussing how superior their ideology is. But of course, if anyone reads the uh, Gospels, they would note that concentration camps and torture and exploitation are absolutely not what quote unquote Jesus would do. So it shows the hypocrisy of the British and they are able to deconstruct that in these camps through this education system. Oftentimes, this schooling led to new oathing ceremonies on the camps, which is a, an important revelation if we consider, going back a few videos in the series, that the entire pipeline process began because of oathing ceremonies. The fact that they were taking place on the camps uh, shows the resiliency of the Mau Mau freedom fighters.
There were also, as one might imagine within these camps, sellouts. These sellouts were called fundi. These sellouts basically used their trades or skills to barter with the guards or their colonial masters for better treatment. Sometimes they even sold sex, uh, which is important to note. Some of them were informants as well. And the informants, if they were caught by other Mau Mau in the camp, were often killed by the Mau Mau. It must also be stated, however, that some of the home guards or the Askaris that were meant to basically guard the Mau Mau rebels in these concentration camps um, became empathetic to the plight of their detainees and were not necessarily willing to torture them uh, 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 to the, the, the levels of the British. In fact, and I quote, they were very ashamed for what they had done. They beat us because they hated themselves for what they were doing. It must also be stressed that those living in these camps uh, uh, were not completely powerless themselves. They began to write letters and smuggle those out, i.e. the way of the Magnani Times, but not just through the way of the Magnani Times. Technically, they were allotted the right to write letters by the camp leaders themselves. I mean, and this, this went all the way up to the governor of Kenya himself, Evelyn Baring. They're supposedly supposed to be able to write letters. And most of these letters, of course, went through their own screening process, and many never even made it out of the camp. But the few that did, did sometimes make their way uh, either to the capital, the colonial capital, capital in Nairobi, or sometimes out to new to international news outlets, and some all the way back to London itself. It must be stressed that in these letters, it was not lost on the detainees how disgustingly hypocritical their British colonial masters had become. The letters went everywhere. In these letters that eventually made it out of the camps, they appealed. Most importantly, they thought of what Kenyan would be when they won their independence. And the fact that they were discussing the ways that they were going to win their independence means that being put in these concentration camps had not basically doused the flame of, of freedom and equality that the, many of these Kenyan freedom fighters had spent their entire lives uh, uh, basically working towards. It's important to understand that many of these letters revealed a keen insight into the historical context in which they found themselves. One of the letters that's super interesting to think about is a letter titled, Is This the British System or the Nazi System? These letters started to prove effective, especially the letters that had made their way back to uh, uh, London. And it's important to understand that the letter's efficacy led to making them illegal within certain camps. Many of them were purged with the re from the record, and if you were caught writing a letter, you were often punished. Many of these punishments took place at camps for women, because the women were granted just slightly more freedom than the Mau Mau men. So at a camp called Kamiti, for example, letter writing became a prominent way of showing one's resistance and defiance in the face of British colonialism. Um, it was even, the, the, the camp in question was even called the eyes and ears of Mau Mau because of the way that they were able to, of course, disseminate information, not just between the camps, but out to the countryside among remaining uh, free freedom fighters still fighting um, the good fight. This camp was run by Catherine Warren Gosh. She was nicknamed Mahuru, i.e. the Eagle. Her favorite tactic to use, especially against letter writers, was torture. And that torture wasn't just physical, it was often psychological. She would threaten the lives of their children. In fact, 15% of the women in this camp were in this concentration camp uh, with their kids. Their kids were there. An example of what life was like in this camp comes to us from Wali Warimu, again from the book Britain's Gulag by Carolyn Elkins. She has this to say, and I quote, They informed me that they had just killed my husband at a place called Mumbuchi, and then they started beating me. They were using their gun butts to hit me. One would hit me, and the blow would throw me to the other. One would hit me and throw me to the next. Nobody cared about where they were hitting me. I was beaten until I was confused, and I didn't care anymore if they killed me. My two-year-old son, who had been woken up by the noise and my screams, ran to me, passing between the legs of the soldiers. As I was being thrown by from the blows from one soldier to the next, my son was just trying to hide, myself, hide himself between my legs. They were then shouting at me, telling me that they were going to give me my independence, that they had done what they had done to the husband to get me. They did not seem to care that there was a small child, scared to death and screaming his head off. As I was being thrown from one soldier to the next, my son fell down and was trampled by these frenzied soldiers. I was beaten so much that my body had grown numb until I could no longer feel the pain. They then took me outside and the last thing I saw was my son's dead body lying on the floor of my house. 
These letters and these accounts that would eventually slowly but surely be funneled out of the camps uh, led to investigation by the colonial power. And that investigation by a governor named Twining at this point in time revealed, and I quote, that violence in the form of whipping on the soles of the feet, burning with lighted cigarettes and tying leather thongs around the neck and dragging victims along the ground had been used on the interrogated. Between 170 and 200 were gathered of whom at least 32 were badly injured and others received some injury. Hayward himself took an active part in the chastisement of the Africans and is said to have threatened to shoot one man after pointing his revolver at him. So even the British colonial officials, as they began to investigate what was going on at these camps, and even during the screening process before the camps, showed that torture was becoming a prominent method of, 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 of punishment. Um, and it didn't matter. It didn't matter age uh, or gender. Um, it, it, and it didn't even matter if you were actually in a, a, a convicted Mau Mau freedom fighter, you were going to be tortured in this process. As more and more inquiries were being made, both within Kenya and back in England, and of course around the world, uh, the pipeline system began to break down just a little bit. This led to a new and kind of final solution, and, and that word should not be lost on our listeners here, known as villagization, which basically meant the concentration of all other Kikuyu uh, that were not already in camps. 1,050,899 Kikuyu were forced into 230,000 huts, merely forcefully moving these individuals from where they were to these basically pre, pre, pre-made pre villages by the British colonial uh, powers led to about 50,000 deaths. And that's just in the process of moving the individuals there. The home guards began to round them up and to make sure that these individuals would never leave the villages that were being set up by the colonial powers, they torched all of their old villages. All of the land was then redistributed to other Kenyans that were not Kikuyu. This was heavily aimed at punishing what were called, quote unquote, the heathen women and children that were loyal or sympathetic to the Mau Mau cause. The women in these new villages were forced to dig the trenches outside, and these trenches were then, of course, filled with barbed wire borders and what were called nyambo, which were essentially sharpened spike sticks. They were digging these ditches, oftentimes with like their own children strapped to their backs. Also created in these villages for punishment were something called the dockies, or better known as the hole. Essentially, holes were dug that were about four feet deep. So if you were accused of basically doing anything that went against either a home guard or a British colonial official's uh, uh, directive, you were stuck in this hole that's four feet deep. And it was full, half with water and sticks. It was unlit and overcrowded to ensure that you would never receive any comfort. You couldn't sleep, you couldn't eat, and of course you could not drink. Uh, while you were in this hole. Mau Mau sympathizers or admitted Mau Mau sympathizers in these villages were publicly hung, shot. Children were often skewered on those uh, sharpened sticks already, mess, uh, uh, already mentioned, and they were often paraded around. Others were put in bags and lit a fire. And again, our source on this is Britain Gu- Britain's Gulag, the book by Carolyn Elkins. Part of the psychological torture was getting, uh, was stripping women down and forcing them to pose in sexually suggestive positions with their older male relatives, grandfathers, uncles. Um, yeah, essentially there was just no, uh, no action too trite for either the home guards or the British uh, officials uh, to impart upon these women that were in these villages. Uh, during this period of time, um, diseases again began to spread relatively quickly. We've already discussed both in this video and prior videos that typhoid was a major problem, but eventually scurvy as well, and even diarrhea because the diets were so bad that people were literally dying of diarrhea in these camps. The colonial medical department um, even began to take notice and their uh, uh, inquiries were ignored, both at the uh, colonial level in Nairobi and at the international level all the way back in London. All of this eventually worsened with what I had already mentioned, the shutdown of uh, Thomas Asquith's concentration camp pipeline as thousands of both white and gray uh, level Mau Mau were returned to these villages and it led to even more overcrowding. So many overlooked side effects 
uh, basically were created during this time period that are often overlooked and still affect Kenya today uh, that must be discussed in the, in, in the village. Uh, PTSD would be one of those. Guilt and shame, especially talking about when we're talking about like the, the psychological torture. Um, even what would be called uh, a half caste babies or nusu nusu because of like the amount of like mass rape that took place on these camps. These led to, again, numerous social and cultural issues that many uh, Kikuyu are still, again, seeking reconciliation for today. Another side effect that we must discuss was the introduction of loyalty cards. So if you ended up back at the village and you acted like a good Kikuyu under your colonial masters, you were given a loyalty card, which often gave you access to land or employment or your prior resources. If you remained defiant, you did not get a loyalty card. This, of course, created division in the camps. And that division, again, is another side effect that is, exists to this day, that many of the people that were given these materials material rewards, uh, garnered at least moderate wealth, and we know how wealth works in, in certain systems, certain economic systems. That wealth exists to this day. Those that remain defiant never garnered that wealth, and of course are still suffering uh, from socioeconomic stratification. So that's important to understand. This took place at the villagization level. Villagization was kind of the winding down of the, uh, basically the colonial horrors that the British were committing in Kenya. And what we're going to pick up on in the, the very next video in this series are how the revelations affected legislation back in the UK and how that legislation eventually led to Kenyan independence.